So we have been going through the book of uh, Joshua. We are in Joshua chapter 13. Joshua chapter 13 is kind of boring. <laughs> Unless you were an Israelite. But I want you to think of this. So what happens, what is happening is that, um, you know, they, they were plucked from the wilderness, they were plucked from Egypt, they wandered in the wilderness, and then uh, finally uh, they decided it was time to go into Canaan. The Lord spoke to Joshua, told him to just do everything he commanded, that he would drive out all of these enemies and give them this land. It was a promise, but it wasn't a promise given to Joshua. It was a promise that was given in Genesis, all the way back in Genesis, I think around chapter 15, to Abraham, that Abraham would bear children more than the uh, sand on the seashore, and that generation would become a nation unto God. And so this promise was given to Abraham. Now, when this land allotment, which is what's going to happen from 13 all the way to the end of the book of Joshua, where they're going to allot the land, they're going to draw the boundaries of the land that's been assigned to each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And um, when they do that, uh, it's super important to them. Not so much to us when we look at this, right? But in this, it would be like this. So how many of you here, uh, if you chose a vacation, would you go to the mountains, raise your hand, or the ocean? Which one would go to the mountains? Okay, that would include Lake Tahoe, by the way, right? So how many of you would rather go to Lake Tahoe than Fort Bragg on the ocean? How many would rather go to Fort Bragg? How many would rather go to Hawaii? <laughs> All right, so... Imagine that someone in your family you never knew owned some land on a beach or some land around Lake Tahoe. And you, five generations later, say, hey, uh, we just got this will and testament uh, because this last of the fourth generation passed away and now... Uh, it, this will can be opened by you because that's the way the will and testament was, op was written. And you, when you opened it and you, and you heard that there might be some land involved, would you go, hmm, that's kind of boring? Or would you go, man, I can't wait to see what, what's been given to me, right? Well, so when God spoke to Joshua and he started to allot these territories and these boundaries of land, it was super important to them. And so we know that everything in the Bible is written for our instruction and for our uh, training in righteousness. And so we take a look at this uh, this morning and we say, okay, what is it that we can pull from this? What can we extract from these land uh, you know, boundaries? And, and uh, what does it mean to us and how do we apply it to our lives? So that's where we're going this morning. Okay, so I'm going to read until I get to about... Uh, verse 7. And I'm not going to read the whole uh, entirety of the chapter, much like we've been doing before, all the way to 32. I'm just going to read till I hit this one word. And then this one word is going to repeat again. And then we're going to focus on this one word and what it means to us, okay? So, 13.1. Now Joshua was old and advanced in years. And the Lord said to him, you are old and advanced in years. But yet there remains yet very much land to possess. This is the land that yet remains. So in other words, even though Josh was old and, and advanced in years, there was still more to do. And this is the land that yet remains, all the regions of the Philistines and all of those of the Gershites from Shihor, which is east of Egypt, northward to the boundary of Ekron, it is counted as Canaanite. There are five rulers of the Philistines, those of Gaza, Ashad, Ashkelon, Goth, and Ekron, and those of the Avim, in the south of all the lands of the Canaanites. If I read it fast, you think I know what I'm saying here. So, And Merah, that belongs to the Sidonians, to Aphak, to the boundary of the Amorites, and to the land of the Gibelites, and of all of Lebanon, towards the sunrise, from Baal God, below Mount Hermon, to Lebo Hama, all the inhabitants of the hill country, from Lebanon to the... Misrapoth, Mayim, even to all the Sidonians. And then he says this, something about himself. I myself will drive them out before the people of Israel. So they had to go take possession of this land that was allotted to them, but not without 
a little more spiritual warfare. And then he said, um, uh, I want you to allot the land to Israel for, and here's one of the interesting words, an inheritance. I want you to allot the land to Israel for an inheritance as I have commanded you. Now, therefore, divide this land for an inheritance to the nine tribes in the half tribe of Manasseh. And so the rest of this chapter talks about the inheritance that were on the east side of the Jordan, the two and a half tribes. And then the 14 all the way through the rest is all of the other tribes and their land allotments, the whole entirety of the rest of the book of Joshua. There's some good takeaways as we're gonna finish the book of Joshua, uh, maybe in 2027, but anyway, <laughs> uh, we'll get there. But I want you to notice this word inheritance. So an inheritance, it, it can't be assumed unless it was a promise, unless it was written down somewhere, right? Well, God wrote it down in Abraham's heart and says, look it, this is going to happen. I'm going to give you all of this land. But Abraham never realized it, but they did after his death. He was, it was given to Moses and Moses never realized it. It was given to them after Moses' death as an inheritance from God, right? So no one receives the opening of a will in a testament until after someone dies, right? As long as they're living, it's not an inheritance, all right? So we know that in the Old Testament, there's a lot of things written for our instruction that, that bleed over into the New Testament that becomes a shadow or a type of something. We know that Joshua, his name means Yeshua. It means salvation, salvation from God. And we know that he's coming in as their leader to take this land and to give them their inheritance, right? To fight for them. And the angel of the Lord goes ahead of them, we found out. So with that in mind, I want you to notice something. If you went home today and you read the chapter 13 to its entirety and you took a highlighter, 10 times the word inheritance shows up. All right. So we're gonna take that word and we're gonna say, okay, well, what does that mean to us today? This is very difficult for me to explain in 30 minutes because it is so deep, it is so wide, it is so vast. But if we could mine the depths or even begin to mine the depths of our inheritance, right? Then it should stop us in our tracks from murmuring, from complaining, from, from holding too fast the things of this world, from from making mountains out of a molehill, from, from taking someone's offense and applying more thought to it, more thought to it and unforgiveness to it. it. It should change the whole way in which we live if we really know God and we really understood what he's done on behalf of us because just as we have an inheritance in Christ, and this is where I'm going today, we are his inheritance. And he couldn't get his possession until someone died. And it was his son. And when his son died, and when his son was buried, and when his son rose, right? And by faith, we acquire that righteousness. Now we become sons and daughters of God for his possession, for his inheritance. I want you to take a look at something in the Old Testament that will like, I hope, just go, whoa, I never saw that. Or maybe you saw it and it just, you just kind of read over it and it didn't mean as much as it, I hope it does today because this is where the heart of worship comes from. This is where understanding that God is just magnificent, where it all comes from and, 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 and how we can really call him father and understand that we could trust him as father. So take a look in Deuteronomy 32. Before Canaan, right, there was this promise and God was speaking to them and he was saying, look it, this is, this is who I am and this is what I'm about to do. Look in Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. When the Most High, that's God, gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people. He gave us portions, but his portion was us. 
His people, Jacob, his allotted heritage, meaning Israel. His heritage, it's his inheritance. He found him, that's us, in a desert land and in, in the howling waste of the wilderness. This is us before salvation. I want you to get this. This is us, dead in our trespasses, without knowing which way to go, in the dark, don't even know we're in the dark. That's where he finds us, in a desert land. And he encircled him, and he cared for him, and he kept him as the apple of his eye. What is the apple of his eye? Apple in the Greek, uh, the, the, the meaning of the Hebrew and the Greek word apple isn't a fruit. It's the center of your eye, it's your pupil. And so he looks at us and we are in the center of his eye. He looks at us and he sees every single one of you as his own, as an inheritance. And he's circled you and he's done something magnificent in order to redeem you back to him as his inheritance. And so we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at some scriptures that it's not just me talking, but it's to understand the significance of this, right? And so uh, one thing I, I mentioned first service and I wanna mention again, and this is, this, this is extracted from the book of Colossians, from the book of Ephesians, that um, it basically says in the book of Romans, right? I'm not have time to go through them all, but I want you to, you know, in order for you to understand the magnificent of sense of God's grace and his mercy, you kind of have to understand the backstory. And the backstory is really, it has to be revealed in truth. But too many of us today hear these little passages, you know, on Instagram or Facebook or even in, in, in schools or even at graduation ceremonies, right? And someone will say, we're all God's children. It's not true. We're all made in God's image. We're all made in his image. But because of the sin nature in us, right? In scripture, we're called the children of wrath. The sons and daughters of the disobedient ones. That we're wandering in darkness until he plucks us. Until he encircles us. And he plucks us. And he adopts us. And he saves us. And he washes us. And he cleanses us in the blood of his son, and he reconciles us back to him. And that's when he calls us his sons and daughters. So if you, if you know, right, because the spirit is given to us and the spirit that, that is inside of us, it says that it testifies to us that we are his sons and daughters and that we can call him father. But if you just, just randomly wanton think, okay, I, everyone's a child of God. No, 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 no. It cost him his son, to reconcile us back to him as his inheritance. Amen. That's his inheritance. Someone had to die before we could be called God's sons and daughters. Think of that. Hopefully, as we think about these truths and we ponder these truths, then, then, then it lessens the cheapness inside of us where we think that we're entitled to all these things or, 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 or we make big things out of little things and and we, and we start to complain about things because we don't often think about these things, about what it costs God to redeem us back to him. So take a look at this, okay? Take a look at Ephesians chapter one. We're gonna read through here very quickly. A chap, uh, Pastor Craig has an Ephesians class that took two years to go through, right? <laughs> I don't know how long it took him to go through chapter one, but we're gonna go through a lot of it in about five minutes, all right? So... But really listen, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father of our Lord and his Son Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for the adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. It was his will. To the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. The beloved is his son, capital B, Jesus. 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. I mean, he takes the poor sinner and he makes them rich in God's grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Look at, he's done all of this to redeem us back to himself, but in part to make known the mystery. To make known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he has set forth in Christ. It was his purpose that we would be his pleasure. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. So all of this stuff way back generations before in Joshua was a prototype of what's to come. In him, we have obtained an inheritance. Here's our inheritance. It's not land that'll get burned or that'll get flooded. We've obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things in according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, look at this, you were sealed with the promise, Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. It's like a down payment of what's to come. He, the Holy Spirit that lives inside the believer is our inheritance as a down payment until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory, to the full realization of the possession of our salvation, which is oneness in Christ forever without sin. For this reason, 15, all of that for this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. It's just a little personal thing as he's speaking to the Ephesians, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, watch this, may give you, that's you, the spirit of wisdom. His spirit of wisdom. Why? Why does he want to give you insight? That's what wisdom is. Of the revelation in the knowledge of him. That you would understand this deeply and intimately because there's something that comes, comes after this. He says, I, I'm praying that you'll this knowledge will be revealed to you of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you and what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, his inheritance in us, our inheritance in him. Same coin, two different sides. Unreal. So take a look at this in Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That down payment bears witness. If you're wondering, do I have the Holy Spirit in me, right? Well, if you have conviction, you're convinced that, 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 that God wouldn't co-sign something, that's called sin. If you, if you are convinced of that, that's where it starts. But where it finishes is that the Holy Spirit would convince you, Scripture says, of Christ's righteousness, his perfection, right? Why does he want to show you that? Because he wants to show you that your sins have separated you from a holy God, but his sinless sacrifice, right, is the beginning of this redemption back to the Father, the reconcile us back to the Father. And so understanding that my faith, I believe that he was righteous, and I believe that he took my unrighteousness on his righteous self and died a criminal's death. And no longer the wrath of God is against me. I'm one of his sons. I'm one of his daughters. Why? Because I believe he did that. And I believe there was no other way except that way. And so when he comes up out of the grave and we confess in our heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he raised him from the dead, then we can't see it. But right then and right there in our hearts is landed the Holy Spirit that bears witness to us that I'm his son 
I'm his daughter. And something comes up and out of you that says, I probably shouldn't go that way. I probably should go this way. But it also will be like this. Oh, shoot, I went this way. And he goes, that's okay. You're my son because grace is what saved you, not your works, right? And that should just stop you on your tracks and go, wait a minute. I don't want to cheapen that grace by going back there again. I want, I want to be worthy of this calling. Here's the coolest part, right? So after we're redeemed and after we're reconciled back to the Father and the Father has this inheritance through his Son and we're in him and we have the Holy Spirit, right? When we get to heaven, there's going to be a wedding and the Father is going to take us and give it back to his Son as a love offering. This was my inheritance and we've done it all for you, son. And everything that is found in Christ Jesus will now be ours. Everything. He's even going to ask us to rule and reign with him. All this creation, all the universe, we don't know what's yet to come. That should blow your mind. Yes. And it should cause you to pause before you complain about little, little things. Yes. It really should, right? So take a look at this. Um, I'm kind of getting caught up in it. <laughs> I like it. I love it. I mean, he loves us. He really does. And, you know, our devotions, our affections should be poured out on the feet of Jesus. Yes. That's what we're singing. Okay. So, let's go to 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ of the dead. That born again experience comes from his being brought up from death to life. And this, this uh, Jesus who has risen from the dead, right, has caused us to inherit and inherit something, right? Look at this. To an inheritance that is imperishable. It's undefiled, unfading, and it's kept in heaven for you. So think about this, you guys. I don't know if you just slow this down a minute or two and say it's, it's, it's undefiled. Nothing can take the purity out of what's being kept for us. Nothing can fade it. Nothing can stain it, right? No matter what happened, Jesus never succumbed to any sin and he's waiting for us in heaven and he is our inheritance and so much more so much more we don't know what awaits us but too often on this side of heaven we don't think about that enough it says to put our hearts and our minds and our thoughts on things that are eternal not below and so take time just take a little bit of time to remember just parts and pieces of this this morning and go home and think, wow, God went to great lengths to claim me as his own. He has a future for me. He has a hope for me. He has a purpose for me while I'm here. And he just like going to Josh at an old age, he says, hey, there's still a lot more to possess. I want you to think about this for a minute because let me finish reading it first. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so here we go. So this, this inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, unfading. It's kept in heaven for us. See, it's like it's safe there. Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you understand that little seed of faith that he has put in your heart in order for you to believe that Christ died for your sins and rose? That little bit of faith that he has put in there, he's guarding it right now. Think about that. This is how much he loves you. This is how much his inheritance means to him. I'm guarding it. That's why you can wander and wander and wander. And next thing you know, that little faith comes back up. I'm back. I'm coming back. I'm coming home. And he says, welcome. Think about that. It's being guarded. It's being protected. This is how much value it is to him. Sometimes scripture just needs to be like, like, like real. Because it is. And so he goes on. He says, um, so, so listen, you know, 
Wait, I'm getting ahead of myself again. <laughs> in this, we should rejoice, <laughs> right? Uh, we should rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. That's part of it. I want you to put your finger there. And then I want you, Cooper, to go back to Romans 8, verse 16. This is all part of our inheritance. Romans 8, 16, the spirit of himself bears witness to our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and then fellow heirs with Christ. Provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Yes. So the co-heir of Christ, some people take that as all this crazy stuff and authority and all this stuff that is only reserved for us in heaven. But what's really going on in, as co-heirs of Christ is like when we suffer, we are partnering with him and he is partnering with us. And we, this, it says in scripture, this momentary and light affliction should pale into comparison to the far exceeding glory that awaits us in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so, yeah, that's going to be revealed too. But right now, when you go through suffering, he doesn't waste it. It's part of our inheritance. It's part of being a co-heir of Christ. All right. So now we go back to that scripture where where we're rejoicing though, now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So when we go through suffering, we're supposed to be transformed from glory to glory to glory, to take out the spot, to take out the wrinkle, to take out our nature and put his nature in, right? This is his precious and good promises. So it could be that he is allowed a certain trial, like someone coming up against you, someone in your family that is, you feel like has wronged everybody and you've decided just to shut them out and you've decided like, oh, no, no more of that, right? I'm not going to go there what you're really saying is I'm better than they are and what you forgot was that you know sometimes we suffer for a little while and maybe the possession that you still have to take of his divine nature is understanding how he forgave you and how how he wants to apply that same forgiveness while you are still here so that you can enter into the sufferings of Christ and forgive them like he's forgiven you and that's just one little thing. Or being patient when you're, with your spouse. That's a whole nother thing. Like giving grace to someone that doesn't deserve it. I wonder if that sounds familiar. Amen. And maybe, maybe all of that was so that we could take possession of this lot and this boundary and these lines that have fallen pleasant to us. Maybe that's part of our inheritance while we're here. I believe it is. That's what I just read. We're heirs of that. Okay? So, this should test us by fire so that we may be found to result in the praise and the glory and honor and the revelation of Jesus Christ. I could just hear the applause in heaven, right? When one sinner repents, I read that. But I can also almost sense the applause in heaven when we dig deep and we ask for that measure of the Holy Spirit that has been given us to give us another nature, right? That doesn't give wrath out to someone, that, that gives love instead of the judgment, right? And, and I can almost hear the Father saying, that's my son. That's my daughter. That's why my son died. If we could just get this, if we could just put this in our pipe and smoke it, <laughs> or put this on our meat and marinate it, or let this feed our souls, let, let this just feed our souls so that, so that we won't be complainers or murmurers or, or worried about little things. I mean, come on. And if someone is hurting, that we run to them. If someone is like, like sinning, then we, we run there with love. And I mean, on and on and on it goes. And and so, so oh. Colossians 1, verse 9, we're almost done. Cooper, did you get Colossians this time? I'm sorry, got it, got it. Okay, look at this. So how do we apply this? I'm glad you asked. Colossians 1, 9. 
And so, from the day that we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you. This is Paul again. Asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. That you would be filled with this understanding, this mystery. With all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Why? So as to walk in a manner worthy of that calling. Wow. See, if you understand deeply and intimately that you are his possession, you are his heritage, you are his inheritance, and that it came out of the death of his son, right? Now we're to walk in a manner worthy of that. We weren't worthy to deserve it, but now that he's given us that worthiness, he wants us to apply it to our feet, to our heart, to our actions. Will we get it right all the time? No, because we're saved by grace, not by works. Amen. All right? But he wants us to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and to walk, and, 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 and excuse me, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing, look at this, in the knowledge of God. That, Lord, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation to understand this mystery and how deep it is. I want to know that more. I want to know that more. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance, because we're going to need it, and all patience and with joy. Giving thanks to the Father, look at this, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Wow, that's his inheritance, us. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and he's transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. You guys, I, I could go on and on and on. If you read scripture in the context of what God has done on our behalf, it should just weaken you to the point of being filled with the Holy Spirit and saying, let's go, let's go, let's go. Come on, I'm in the kingdom. I'm not in the world. I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. I'm in his kingdom. And there's, 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 there's things that he's assigned for us to do. And there's gifts that he's given us. And there's, there's this, the, the fruit of the spirit that he's given us. And yeah, we take time and we do silly things and we go on vacation. Yeah, that's all good. That's all good. But man, when you come home and you have children in your house, if you can explain to them this mystery, little by little, incremental by incremental, until they get a little older, a little older, a little older, hopefully they'll just go, how could I not believe him? How could I not serve him? How could I not walk that way? Instead of the way the world is leading us and guiding us. So lastly, but not leastly, if that's a word, we're going to go to Psalm 16. I, I found this verse and I just like, oh, I got to share this verse. This is David singing. Look at what he says, you guys. This is why everything in the Old Testament is related to the New Testament. And the New Testament is related to what we're going to have as an inheritance when we finally get to heaven. Right? This isn't it. But look at what he says here in this psalm. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup, and you hold my lot. That means all the things that go on in my life, you've held it, you, you've established it. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. That's the borders. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. You ever think of that? Or are you looking for beauty somewhere else? I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night, he also, he instructs my heart. In the night, in my heart, he instructs me. That's that spirit. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be shaken. This is all byproducts of the inheritance. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. Why? Because my Flesh also dwells secure. That means your body because he's not going to waste them. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or hell or the grave or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me 
the path of life. And in your presence, there is the fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. He has given us the counsel of his will, the mystery of his plan, the path to walk in life, all written down in this book, all emanating from what we thought was boring. Inheritance. When you get it, you get it. And when you got it, you want to give it. I wish I could just take whatever little bit I have and just, Keith Green says, just spread it all around. Because that's the way to apply it. And you apply it with things like love and mercy and giving and sacrifice, forgiveness, listening, paying attention, elevating others higher than yourself. All the things that Jesus did were co-heirs with. All of it. Unless you haven't believed. Unless you put your hope and your trust somewhere else. So if you're here or you're online this morning, it just sounds so simple, but it has to start somewhere. It starts with applying that seed that he's planted in your heart so that it turns to the down payment, the Holy Spirit. And upon your confession of faith, according to scripture, the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit will come in declaring you to him as father and you as a son and daughter. If that's you this morning and your sins, you've, you figured it out, your sins have separated you from God and, and you have no other way except through the death of his son. And you want to be reconciled back to God, the Father, who created you, by the way. Then if not by raising your hand or, you know, it seems so simple, but if not by raising your hand, by talking to the person that brought you here or talking to them when you go home, say, man, I, 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 want, to, I want to know Jesus. I loved it when the jailers saw what was going on, Peter, in the book of Acts, and they just yelled out, what must I do to be saved? They got it. And they were saved. And it says not just them, but their whole household was saved. Amen. Think about that. I think about men that are in this room that, that were far off from God. I think about men in this room. I know you. I'm not going to call you out, but I know how far away you were from God because I know what it's like to be far from God. And then, and then to see you incrementally, little by little, take what God has given you and start to walk it out and see your wife blessed, see your family blessed, and then your friendships blessed, and then your mom and dad blessed. I've seen it over and over and over and over. Don't discount, right? Yeah, you should. And so don't discount. Don't discount his inheritance Amen. or yours. Amen. Think about it. If the ushers and musicians would come forth and will receive communion. If you're here, we take communion because we believe what God did for us. You're free to take communion if you believe that his body was broken for you and that his blood was poured out for you for the remission to take away your sin. That's why we take communion, to remember that. If you're here this morning, don't let it bypass you if you've bypassed it in the past by, by forfeiting that because you didn't understand it. But the only thing that's required, it says we do this in remembrance of him. We do this because what he's done. So don't let it go by you this morning. If right now you just wanna say, Jesus, uh, you giving me some faith. I want to exercise it. Holy Spirit plants himself in you. And you start to walk with him. You can go ahead and pass that. While we're waiting, I want to give you a little 
Can I give you a little extra while we're waiting? Cooper, put the last verse up in chapter 13. When he allotted the land to the 12 tribes of Israel, he never allotted land to the Levites because the Levites were chosen to be priests. He gave them some cities, but he never gave them land. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses gave no inheritance. What? The Lord of God of Israel is their inheritance. Just as he said to them. Which would you rather have? Tahoe? Fort Bragg? The hotel in Marysville? <laughs> or God? Or God? He's given it to us. It's acquired by faith. It's acquired by belief. Not by works. When you think of what you really deserve. When you think that you deserve the punishment of your sins and you don't deserve to be around God and how could he take me, right? And then you figure out that he does by the sacrifice of his perfect son. It should leave you in this place of just this wonderful mystery and awe of God and complete gratitude. Also, when you read the scripture, read it for yourself. Put your name in there. Hey, Bob, you're old and you're advanced in years. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> but yet, there remains very much more land. can't wait to sing this song so perfect thank you You know, sometimes we forget that there's one more. Oh, here he comes. There's a lot more. Sometimes we, um, I think we, not, not really on purpose, but we, we just don't think about this enough. the mystery of his will. And so pray that God would give you this spirit of discernment and revelation of who he is and what he's done. Just slow down every once in a while and rest and rest in the arms of Jesus and the love of God. Angelo, you're a lot like Aiden. You're looking, as Shane told me, he goes, Bob, my son is looking for his tribe. At his school, there was many people from that tribe and he didn't settle because he's still looking for that tribe. And Angel, Angel, you might as well be. Angelo, you are of that tribe. You are his son. 
And you more than me have been given that spirit of revelation. And that's why when you and I kind of connect, there's without words even, even if you couldn't see me, there's just something that goes on where deep cries out to deep, Angelo. And you are blessed. You are blessed to be God's inheritance. Father, we thank you for your your wedding table, your bank wedding table of love, that table of forgiveness that was set with his disciples. And we get to do that today in remembrance of you, that this is your body that was broken for us. This is the cup that was poured out for the remission of sin. And we thank you, Lord, that you have redeemed us back to you, that you've given us our inheritance in Christ, and that you would even call us your inheritance. Let's celebrate that and eat and drink together.